This video was made in partnership with yours. I don't think I've met anybody that's not thoroughly enjoyed The Mandalorian. It's truly a sensational series that served two vital functions. One, remedying Star Wars fans' faith in Disney as the owners of the franchise, and two, fulfilling every young Star Wars fan's dream of seeing more on-screen action from characters wearing the iconic Mandalorian armor. Now, unfortunately, I think think Book of Boba Fett hasn't done enough to sanctify these two functions as I'm currently baffled primarily by the setting of this show. Placed right after the events of The Mandalorian Season 2, we see Boba Fett and his shoehorned sidekick Fennec Shand playing the diplomats in Mos Espa, trying to boot out the Pike Crime Syndicate. After four gruelling episodes of establishing backstory and allies, we have two episodes with Mando literally stealing the show because apparently Apparently they didn't have enough up their sleeves when it came to Boba. It's clear the producers have a favourite between their new bounty hunter and the old rusty one. I say this because the best part of Boba in this series is when he's tied up with the Tusken Raiders. Despite doing a good enough job humanising them in The Mandalorian to take it even further by both turning the tables on the tragedy and seeing their rituals and routines was imaginative and emotional. This part of the timeline was an interesting area of discovery and intrigue. You know where else would be interesting? literally anywhere between the end of the Clone Wars and the original trilogy. Boba working for the Empire or even exploring how he went from being a little forgotten boy to the great bounty hunter would have been great. It's not like Disney hasn't begun carving out this area for the Bad Batch, but even that wound up being pretty eh by the end, so I'm not entirely sure this would have been for the best either. I can't help cynically feel that Disney's black and white perspective on good and evil in Star Wars prevents them from exploring a character like Boba properly. He's a hero now, guys, not a villain or somewhere in between. I mean, for God's sake, they renamed Slave 1 to the Fire Spray Gunship, which to me just says it all. <sighs> Okay, Harry, it's only a TV show. Take a chill pill, or even better, try some breathing techniques, meditation, and yoga with yours, the fastest growing self-care and mindfulness app on the market. I'm not really sure many people know this, but I've been practicing yoga at home since March 2020, and it's allowed me clearer thinking, peace of mind, and many other benefits. I've partnered with yours to promote and extend these benefits to you, dear viewer. The app is tailored to whatever your mental health requires. If you have trouble sleeping or need help managing stress and anxiety, yours has you covered. Yours will also give you a personalized experience thanks to AI technology. There's also audio on this app, classical music, lo-fi, study music, and there's just loads of things on here to help you relax and make you calm. If you're not sure, you can try it out for a seven day free trial. And if you find it doesn't work out for you, they have a 30 day money back guarantee as well. Click my link in the description or use the code HARRY for an exclusive 60% discount off the yours yearly plan. Now, without further ado, let's get on with the review. Can we just appreciate how uninviting these subtitles for the episodes are? Boba Fett partners with Fennec Shand? Mysteries are explored and Boba Fett learns new information? How enticing. Boba is seen dreaming about the gigantic hole George Lucas put him in nearly 40 years ago. It was supposed to happen 30 years ago. Now, bearing in mind that he managed to climb up from the depths of stomachy hell, I'm not so convinced this is easily done with several kilos of sand ready to flow into the stomach should it be breached in this way. Even climbing up the slippy walls seems like a bit of a stretch given that most victims of this creature are slowly digested over the thousand years. Sometime later, Boba is picked up by the Tusken Raiders. They squeeze carrot juice into his mouth and drag him into the wilderness. LOL, isn't that the Cinema Sins sound effect? 
Fennec then wakes him up, displaying a lack of care for his dreams, urging him to get his bloody trousers on and see some people. She voices her objection to hiring Gamorreans, as well as walking by foot instead of coming by carriage. Considering both were previously under the employ of Jabba the Hutt, it's interesting she wanted Boba to appear powerful above all else. Although she seems like she's more knowledgeable about the Mos Espa hierarchy of power than Boba, it was pretty neat knowing that she's actually trying to cover his back whilst giving us exposition. They enter a bar called Sanctuary that Boba now owns. For some reason, they give him his share of the revenue inside his helmet and then proceeds to walk out and get mugged by a bunch of yobbos. <laughs> Bet you regret not asking for a bag now, don't you? This sequence was, honestly, a complete joke. I get that's kind of the point with these assassins. He is of the Order of the Night Wind. Very expensive. Overpriced. You're paying for the name. But this seemingly effective strategy of surrounding their foes with shields should do the job, right? I swear those electric jabbers aren't set to kill or stun, but simply to tickle. I mean, just look at Fennec getting electrocuted in not one, but eight shots right here. Thankfully, the Gamorians, who literally vanished from behind the pair not seconds earlier, come to the rescue. We then see the last two assassins making an escape across the rooftops, swinging from this pole right here with a shot of below to show just how dangerous it is should a character mess up their parkour. Fennec then follows them, gets cornered, dives off the roof, only for both parties to wind up literally doing a full 180 back to where they started. This isn't the only action sequence director Robert Rodriguez has royally fucked up in this show, but we'll talk about those later on. Boba goes back to his back to tank, and that's the episode's cue for a flashback to. I'm not sure why each and every one of them start out with this weird green effect as though we're looking at them through Luke Skywalker's binoculars. Boba's dragged out into the desert as a prisoner where he or should I say the audience, are shown the faction of criminals whose speeders will be needed in the next episode. Afterwards, they find a gigantic monster lying in the sand that punches and backhands too many times to make it terrifying in any way. I should really by this point in my life know what I'm going in for when it comes to Disney Star Wars, but it gives Boba a way too easy win and a pretty piss poor excuse for killing off the other prisoner. He dies from being pushed beneath the sand? So yeah, the first episode certainly had me scratching my head, but little did I know the confusion had only just begun. It's empty. So apparently we needed a reminder that Boba is now in possession of the Rancor pit. It might be a surprise to the assassin, but it's definitely no surprise to us. In fact, none of the shots in the Sanctuary Bar of glossy gambling and cocktails were a surprise either, seeing as we literally saw it in the previous episode and would be seeing this bizarrely boring montage twice again before it gets destroyed. Everyone in the bar then hears the light tapping of drums coming from far away. I think Disney Plus just assumes the audience has equally sensitive ears, as it's the only streaming app that I have to double the volume for. Not sure if anybody else has this problem, but if you are, please write to your local council with a bright pink kiss stamped on the envelope. Both Jabba's cousins and the badass Wookiee look pretty amazing, and put into perspective just how much work Boba has to do to protect his territory, even though he literally doesn't have to do jack to get the cousins to leave or hire the Wookiee from them. During Boba's lightsaber training, a pikey caravan rolls by and kills a bunch of Tuscans. I fucking hate pikeys. He decides he's going to climb up the Tuscan hierarchy further by going to a bar and knocking the living shit out of some thugs with his newfound stick skills. In exchange for being taught how to wield a stick, Boba teaches the Tuscans how to ride speeders. There's something really great about watching Temuera Morrison in this scene. Hope I pronounce that right, it changes what would be a very Dave Filoni train the natives to defend themselves sequence into something really funny and charming, probably because the Tuscans themselves are equally mysterious and familiar to the audience. Like a bantha. Yes? Maybe not. The train sequence is quite the spectacle. It's nice to see a train heist that's not a train heist and that the Tuscans are purely out for blood. Wait. No, it 
does just wind up being a train heist, my bad. I've always found the pike helmets to be pretty menacing and mysterious in my eyes. Now that the helmet's been lifted though, they just look as fishy as their namesake. I found the Tuscan scene in the tent to be most interesting as the leader describes off-worlders and their machines. There seems to be an anti-colonial message behind the dialogue, once again expanding on what we thought we knew about the Tuscans. Once they were merely savages, now we see them with tools, speaking a language and performing rituals. I particularly like seeing both inhaling that lizard that guides him to the tree where he'd find his stick. It's like watching a white guy take the pipe from a Native American and choking on the tobacco. The segment gives Boba's weaponry and simplistic outfit significance beyond mere acquisition. The Tuscans have become his family, his tribe, and it makes their slaughter all the more saddening. The dance at the end left me with shivers, making me wonder if this kind of exploration could be applied to other intelligent creatures of the Star Wars universe, say the Wookiees or the and oceans, I don't know, just throwing it out there. I just hope that should an official Star Wars musical be on the Disney assembly line that this doesn't wind up in there. But it... <clears throat> it will, won't it? The episode that shall not be named starts off with a summary of the show in its entirety. Everyone is waiting to see what kind of leader you are. No one respects you. I guess this line is played for laughs, but this idea of Boba earning respect gets wrapped up fairly quickly over the next seven minutes of the episode. What is this gang? They are half man, half machine. They modify their bodies with droid parts to make themselves even more deadly. The cyborg. Beware. The cyborg. This guy honestly had me imagining hardcore and potentially horrific people only for Boba to show up and they're just teenagers. It's a crime what he charges. Look, old man, go back to your palace. Teenagers with British accents. Teenagers with British accents and zips. Why'd you let the monger charge us a month's wages for a week's war? Don't have to be sorry, mate. With no work around, Boba decides to hire them and suddenly the water monger just bursts onto the scene proclaiming they have a debt to pay. Boba pays him off and goes home. This is like some weird side quest from The Witcher that's over before it's even begun, except except the quest has only just begun and it's actually part of the main story. Kill me. Awakening from a past memory, the Wookiee starts attacking Boba in his back to tank. I initially wondered why Fennec, the Gamorreans, or even his new cybernetic staff weren't guarding the door. Even without guards, I'm not sure this giant hairy bloke would be able to sneak into Jabba's palace unheard or unseen. Hell, it's not like they don't have patrols. Enough food. Go help with the patrol. It's just that the kitchen staff are also the security guards. As much as it satisfies my inner fanboy to see a Wookiee dealing some proper hand-to-hand -hand damage, it looks like Boba gets his back broken multiple times in this fight, but gets up and dusts it off like it was nothing. I don't mind a character displaying this level of resilience, but it contradicts him needing a back to tank in the first place. This screams weakness to me, and yet he can be thrown around like a rugby ball and come out of it wearing a ducking bathrobe like he's just got out of the shower. Now I honestly thought this Wookiee was going to be the replacement Rancor, but literally two scenes later they trade the Wookiee for an actual Rancor and Machete. They called him Machete. It is said that the witches of Dathomir even rode them through the forest and fence. Now this man knows how to make a sales pitch, though why it's needed when it's already Boba's possession is beyond me. The downward spiral that is the ending of this episode starts with the characters literally going into the mayor's office and leaving out the front door again. This kicks off a hover bike chase sequence that is just frankly awful. With the music blasting away and the composition of shots, you'd think this sequence would be faster, but the whole thing just appears so damn slow to me. Simpsons Hit and Run had a faster hover bike. The modifications of these cyborgs are on show, but they just look really funny to me, and they never get used again. What was most hilarious was how the driver they were pursuing found himself hurtling into a market, knocking down all the stalls without a single casualty. Where the hell are all the merchants and customers. Why is a market set up with nobody inside it? Probably because they could see the chase coming from a mile away. <laughs> I'm not 
done yet! Boba Fett then just appears in front of Biff's car. Was he following them the whole time and we just didn't see him. Just when things couldn't get more ridiculous, a bunch of pikes come strolling out of a space bus. Yes, that's what I'm calling this thing. Not even dressed incognito or anything. With all their spice running shenanigans, I'm genuinely surprised they opted for the cheaper option of public transport. <laughs> After being made homeless, Boba tries to find his ship. Boba and Bantha find Fennec Shand dying on the floor, meaning a considerable amount of time between the first flashback and this one has elapsed. I'm left to assume, therefore, that he spent several years with the Tuscans. It's not entirely unbelievable, but given how relatively little of this time we've seen, I wouldn't blame you if you thought he only spent a few days, or if you're feeling generous, a few weeks with them. Turns out that the blessed side Cyborgs did Boba a solid in the past by saving Fennec. She's then recruited to help grab Slave One, and I started to feel like their dialogue didn't really go beyond him bringing her up to speed with what he's been up to for the past five years. I was left for dead on the sands of Tatooine, like you. I was rescued by the sand people. They took me in, treated me as one of their own. I tried to help them. Instead, I got them massacred by Nikto speed bikers. I mean, this isn't really anything new to me, but do go on. Bit Fortuna took over his territory, and now he rules from that palace. The Tuscans took me and made me part of their tribe. It's a shame that we're not really learning anything about these characters, we're just getting a refresher on recent events. The pair then enter the palace under the cover of Nightfall, and I think now is a good time to talk about the staff at Jabba's palace. Throughout episodes 1, 2, and 3, I was craving to know how and why the palace was still running the routine operations given the sudden change of hands. All the food we saw on the table is explained in this flashback. When Boba shows up to fight the chef droid, this is the kind of shit that would have been perfect for the present day stuff. How he treats the staff would explore how people do or don't respect him. This might sound like an odd comparison, but I found myself addicted to watching Downton Abbey lately. It's a show about a super wealthy Earl and his family in the early 20th century, with perspectives and deep characterization from both them and the servants. The to specifically know exactly what's going on in the house and have their own opinions about it all. It makes the house feel alive and that's something that's sorely lacking with Boba being in charge of the palace. I know it's mostly run by droids, but I think the notion of them bickering and expressing themselves whilst they toil away to be far more interesting than Boba constantly proclaiming I'm going R2 and 3PO do a damn fine job of this all the time. All that talk of Boba trying to fit in as a family man. You're the head of a family. Running a family is more complicated than bounty hunting. Is kind of ironic given that we barely get to see the family he's in charge of. The pair then grab the ship after a quick wave defense game, making them set for any and all adventures ahead of them. And by adventures, I mean straight up massacre of bikers and sarlaccs alike. I honestly loved this this bit. It finally felt like Boba was living up to his reputation. It shot fantastically and I never really appreciated Slave 1 having this ability to rotate and appear so ominous until now. No doubt they'll make this into some kind of roller coaster at Disneyland at some point, but still I appreciated the special effects and a jump scare that completely caught me off guard too. The big reference to Attack of the Clones was sublime too, but I couldn't help but wonder why portions of this episode weren't in the very first one. I'd even go as far as to argue this might not have been a bad episode to kickstart the season. When we see these flashbacks to the Mando season 2 finale, I can't help but wonder if that was the original intention. Had this been the case, you would end up thinking, Wow, Boba really has it out for these speeder dudes, I wonder why he did that. We're then back in the bloody sanctuary bar where once again, Boba walks in and walks out again shortly afterwards. A fight breaks out between some Trandoshans, these lizard people, and Chrysanthemum, the big badass Wookiee dude. Anybody paying attention would know that in the first episode, one of these guys handed Boba a Wookiee pelt as tribute. Apparently there's some beef between the two species, which I'm nowhere near intelligent enough to explain, but just in case in case people got confused about this moment, this is why the Wookiee decided to kill this dude and pay his bar tab. Fennec then started reminding us again of shit we already knew. Jabba the Hutt 
once sat upon that throne. His reign ended in a ball of fire on the Dune Sea, and then Viv Fortuna took his place. I really don't mind her giving exposition directly to Boba as reminders of his position, but by this point in the series, it's just absurd. It's purely for the audience and makes the whole speech come off as preachy at best. He was a terrible leader with no right to the throne. You each tried to take his place, but were thwarted by his guile and treachery. Guile? The guy with two out of ten for brains in Top Trumps is capable of having cunning intelligence? God, these guys at the table must be complete imbeciles if they couldn't outsmart Bib Fortuna. They are then warned by the Rancor, popping up just at the perfect time to scare them all into submission. Once again, had this episode been aired first, the mystery of how a replacement Rancor came about would get the series rolling with intrigue. <laughs> Master Garfolokwox asks what it is that you are proposing. Wait, but hang on, I thought Boba didn't have a protocol droid. We really need a protocol droid. <laughs> Master Garfolokwox finds this acceptable as well. Acquiring a protocol droid could have been an episode in itself. All the variables and missed opportunities surrounding the palace's staff leave so much of this setting feeling empty and hollow. Also, this is an advantage to people thinking you're dead. I'm Boba Fett. I'm Boba Fett. My name is Boba Fett. Yes, we know who you are! Alright, now we're talking. Mando blasts back onto our screens with fanfare and catchphrases galore. He seems to be after one of the blokes seen sitting up the table with Boba. Either that or he's just the same species. You know, I actually don't care. The peculiar setting does most of the talking in this scene. Some kind of refrigerator on this massive halo ring was the perfect setting to reintroduce this character. He's been apart from Grogu long enough that he's essentially been reset to when we first saw him at the beginning of season one in an equally cold setting. This proves to be one of Mando's most brutal fights yet, cleaving through everything with the dark saber he's acquired. It was fascinating to see him struggling to use it as well under the sheer weight of it. Perhaps this is his first time actually using it since acquiring it. It made me wonder how Moff Gideon was trained to use it too. Obviously it's great that Mando's back and it makes sense given the big eyebrow rays of Fennec Shand and Boba claiming they have money and no muscle, but let's talk about the elephant in the room here. I'll go as far as saying two whole episodes worth of the Book of Boba are taken up by The Mandalorian Season 2.5. If Boba matters so little in his own story, I'm not sure why he couldn't just continue being a part of The Mandalorian. Maybe cutting back and forth between the two storylines? I don't know. We then get to see this gorgeously continuous shot over two minutes playing out from Mando getting in the lift, collecting his bounty and going back down again. This was so damn impressive to me. Cool Spidey outfit. Thanks. I imagine the set wasn't altered at all by the backdrop, cast members and extras. I also loved seeing him hobble from this self-inflicted injury, a reminder that he may be bulletproof but not invincible. This reminder will prove to be short-lived though, but I'm getting ahead of myself. What an amazing place he finds the other Mandalorians in. The sight of endless oblivion beneath the whole thing sets me on edge with him climbing downstairs and nearly falling. I swear to God, literally every line of dialogue from the Mandalorians gets me hard as a rock. Mando facing derision for not killing Moff Gideon, and a reminder of the responsibility that lies on his shoulders for even possessing the Darksaber. God damn, the flashback to the Night of a Thousand Tears really blew my face off. To top it all off, we got to see an actual Mandalorian duel as well, with the whole thing culminating with Mando admitting that he took off his helmet. 
Oh, I love him being torn between his lone wolf persona and the creed that he desperately wants to be a part of. Instead, he resorts to taking a space bus to Tatooine and parting with his weapons. It's so saddening yet comical what he's been reduced to now living without purpose or ship. Just in case we were in any doubt about Mando's mind being elsewhere, this shot of the pouch confirms it. Amy Sedaris is back to replace Mando's ship, continuing to bring her lively performance to our screens. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about him flying a Naboo starfighter though. It's certainly flashy, thank god the crappy yellow bits got wiped away in favour of the shiny chrome. <sighs> but I'm not sure it would be the most pragmatic choice. That is, if he goes back out in search of bounties, I'm not sure how much cargo space he'll have for such endeavours. Then again, he'll be getting his second crewmate back by the end of this series, so maybe bounties won't be his priority. This does lead me to wondering if we'll just get more babysitting from random side characters in the third season, so they better have something good cooked up for Grogu than just continuing to sell merch. Finally, I loved the episode closing with him flying close to the space bus. It reminded me of Superman or something, only to get him in trouble with the New Republic lot, the perfect excuse to try out the hyperdrive. I honestly can't fault this episode as an episode of The Mandalorian. As an episode of Boba Fett, it's a different story entirely. You see what I did there? This episode gets proper Western inspired as the Marshal of Mos Pelgo reappears to kick the Pikes out of his territory. I honestly wasn't expecting his return and it's both fitting for the story as well as expanding our perspective on this segment of Tatooine's geography. Meanwhile, Mando goes to see Grogu and Luke doing their Jedi thing. We see these very curiously impressive droids reminiscent of ants building a colony of some sorts. Imagining Mando's frustrated face beneath that helmet helmet helps me sleep at night. We see more of Luke than I was honestly expecting from this episode. He looks astonishingly good now, but I'm not sure how long it will last as CGI develops over the coming years. I suppose that kind of goes for everything CGI, but in such a small gap of time, Luke has improved significantly since his last screen appearance. I loved the moment with the frogs as well, showing Grogu the joy of forestalling instant gratification. I did appreciate not having man Mando and Luke converse, once again tying into the story as Mando's emotions don't quite line up with the Jedi way. Having two father figures will confuse this little bugger, and Mando knows this. It's quite the emotional moment having Mando pull himself away from Grogu again, and then we have an oddly placed training session. It's not that I don't want to see this, it's very nostalgic, yes, but I continually remind myself that this is the book of Boba Fett we're talking about here. This all seems to be a bit too excessive and too much of a distraction to be justified in this show. The only real moment of significance is when Grogu is given the choice of returning to Mando or staying to complete his training. It harkens back to Luke being given the choice in Empire, as well as matching up with the theme of the episode about choice that Ahsoka and Mando were talking about in a previous scene. Mando then arrives for the town meeting, where I realised Boba hadn't said a word for the past two episodes. I guess they finally got the memo. I speak far too much. Mando is then sent to rally the folks of Freetown to Boba's cause. I think this might be the only example of Boba actually giving somebody a job and seeing it play out. I had this sort of scenario in my mind when imagining this show, many instances of Boba wielding power and using it to direct underlings to do his bidding, except these leadership qualities never really sprout from his actions in the present day. I thought it was really impressive seeing the bones of the dragon being used as decoration. You see it clearly on top of the Jawa tank, but also the bones are used inside the bar, serving as good reminders of this town's significance. There was also Cad Bane showing up with an amazing Clint Eastwood vibe, and looking absolutely terrifying. Those goddamn teeth and the eyes, my god they did a grand job of bringing such a notable Clone Wars character to life. He must be ancient though. I was honestly suspecting the episode to end there, but apparently the Pikes had to go and blow up the Sanctuary Bar as well, which I literally didn't care about in the slightest. 
Okay, okay, so na now we're at the really sticky episode. I'll just say that I'm mixed about it because the action is at the centre of it. Sometimes it can be thrilling and awe-inspiring, other times... Well, I'll just start separating the wheat from the chaff bit by bit so you can see what I'm talking about. Boba and Fennec investigate the explosion and for the first time I found myself intrigued by the cyborgs and their insistence on staying in the town as opposed to hiding in the palace. Boba as a leader only makes himself look worse by retreating. Trouble is, the bar looks so destroyed that it might not even be a safe place to stay in. What if a giant beam like this one just fell on somebody's head? It's a good job they wear helmets, I guess. Grogu arrives in Mos Eisley and I'm left to assume that the trio in Sanctuary just sat here for a whole day twiddling their thumbs. Suddenly the characters just start telling and not showing like it's nobody's business. As we wait for the reinforcements to arrive with Cobb Fan, our forces are quietly patrolling the streets of the old city. Quietly? Quietly? Have you seen the colour of those scooters? The Pike Syndicate has not yet arrived in numbers. How many? I saw a dozen at least. They arrived on the Starliner. The Pike Syndicate has not yet arrived in numbers, but the minute they do, we will see them before they see us. Well, you're wrong about that too. The Fat Gatra is taking refuge in the ruins of the Sanctuary. So either the trio are really bad at keeping an eye out for spies, or the Pikes magically knew that the trio were hiding at the Sanctuary. The exposition doesn't end there though, as Fennec's voiceover keeps the boredom going. The Gamorian guards are posted in the Clactunian territory Chrysanthemum is in Trandoshan territory. Drash and Scad are with the other mods, keeping an eye on the Workers' District and the Aqualish Quarter. As you can see, all our flanks are covered. I'm having real trouble seeing this invisible PowerPoint presentation, Fennec. I understand this is all mainly directed at Mando, but Boba seems to be standing there without a fucking clue too. What made me clueless was how the torture robot and the Twi'lek bloke were just there. They had him chained up in the palace last I saw. Now he's waving his arms about, ready to take someone's eye out. Why? Who knows? Maybe we'll find the kitchen staff in the corner cooking up some ash porridge for dinner. We then move to a formidably well shot standoff between Boba and Cad Bane. I was expecting a bit of a bigger reaction from Boba given that these two allegedly have non-canonical history. I think it was great though how Cad revealed that the Pikes killed the Tuscans, possibly in the attempt to anger him and make him do something stupid. I did appreciate Fennec coming to the rescue, but only because she seems to have X-ray vision capable of seeing Boba's face through the back of his head. You're emotional. A shootout then begins between the testicle mouth aliens and the cyborgs. I thought it was pretty cool having the Wookiee be completely overwhelmed by trans oceans crawling all over him like ants, but then he just shows up later without any means of escape made clear to us. Meanwhile, the trio continue to twiddle their thumbs. Does the Pike Syndicate still operate out of Moss Eisley? Surely you would want to know that before before the fight begins, right? Why didn't you send somebody to take out command and control before your friends from Come Dine With Me stab you in the back? So Fennec shoots off on a speeder instead of, say, using Slave One or the shiny Naboo fighter Mando's recently acquired. She gets the cyborgs out of trouble with such ease that I was surprised she wasn't a little pissed off that the people Boba is paying are doing such a shite job. Instead, Hey. Thank you. Manners. I like it. You're welcome. Are you fucking kidding me? How have we gone from this? <laughs> to this. Manners. I like it. You're welcome. Who even are you, Fennec Shand? So after the first wave is dealt with, the Pikes then come out of the woodwork. Boba uses that Twi'lek diplomat as a distraction, with him and Mando flying and shooting because they're just that cool. This was great stuff considering they're bulletproof and would be hard to aim at whilst airborne. Sadly, the prolonged deflection of bullets just got tiresome to watch. Hey idiots! They're not entirely covered in armor, yet magically all blasts seem to be magnetically attracted to their armor. I mean, look at this guy up here who has a scope shooting everywhere but the target. And Jesus Christ, this shot is way too saucy for its own good. Just keep coming. Just when we thought things were looking to be slightly too difficult for the pair. 
The people of Freetown. Oh, I'm sorry, have you guys met already? The cyborgs then arrived just at the right time too, and this was where possibly the biggest problem with the action became clear to me. There are just so many instances of characters being right in the center of a street, in the middle of the line of fire, wearing plot armor thicker than Jabba and his cousins combined. This is what should be happening. Instead, we just get shot after shot after shot of the garrison being, as Boba puts it, Bent of fodder. and not a single person falling to the ground. So the droider cars, sorry, <clears throat> Scorpenic droids, they look great. Well, of course they do, it's Star Wars. I'm glad they didn't curl up into a little ball and start rolling around the place and make it too on the nose. The longer they hang around though, the more pathetic they become. Wanna know how many characters they kill? I think the answer is none. There are three non-Gamorian casualties that we see on screen, only two of which may have been killed by a robot. Why is this episode so afraid of killing off Boba's new friends? If this is war, they're going to war. We are at war. Make it bloody look like one. Peli and Grogu then show up in a cart, acting as though there aren't massive robots patrolling the streets of Mos Espa, only to see one and... <laughs> Oh, good god, this is embarrassing. Their cart gets flipped over and then disappears out of thin air? Just before you start thinking about how Mando is stood right in front of this thing with Grogu in his arms, once again in the middle of a street ready to not be obliterated by this giant machine, the episode's deus ex machina shows up, with Boba Fett riding on top. It's pretty fucking awesome. It's not too much of a stretch to believe, I just don't know where exactly it would be stored for such easy access into the city. Whilst Mando's off on his adventures in episodes 5 and 6, I can believe this would be enough time for Boba to get trained riding him. The combined forces of Boba, Mando, the Rancor and Grogu to beat that thing was pretty swell even if it didn't really pose a threat to begin with. Only after a long parade of people and robots has passed through the streets does the garrison decide to take cover. The main cyborg girl then decides to take a friend up to the roof to do some sniping. Without question, this bartender, who has been nothing but stubborn since his first appearance, swaps his big rifle for this girl's pathetic little pistol and is absolutely fine with it. What was the point of this little exchange? I really don't understand. After that, Cad Bane comes along, the only person suited up to frighten off a Rancor. We then get an almost carbon copy of the showdown scene from earlier. Clear out. Tell your bosses we know they're outnumbered. Clear out. Take your hoodlum gang with you. Oh my god, how do you cock up so badly that you dub characters' dialogue? over the top of them inhaling. You can tell these two are experienced bounty hunters though, literally throwing all they have at each other. I also realized in this moment that none of the characters actually have plot armor, which made this fight all the more breathtaking. I'm not even saying Cad's dead, I mean, why else would they put a blinking red light on his costume? It was glorious to see the Rancor loose in the city, raging like King Kong. It's all super visually impressive stuff, especially with Mando trying to calm it down and near getting his fucking head bitten off. And I won't even lie, I thought Grogu was gonna force choke the Rancor to put it out of its misery, but instead he just puts it to sleep? Damn, Jedi can do that? Uh -huh. So the baddies are dead and literally everybody is happy. Boba has a gang of friends now and the whole ending is so painfully simplistic. All those homes destroyed from the collateral damage, it's easier to just not think about them really. Just laugh at the Wookiee eating a melon boys and girls. So, did it suck? I feel like I've said this phrase a lot lately, but Boba Fett is genuinely a mixed bag. The biggest problem I believe this show suffers from is the choice of setting. I'm not sure why they picked this final shot of Boba's ultimate victory to be the starting point of the series. Not enough was done to establish why Boba has such an attachment to Mos Espa to begin with either. He might have grown attached to it whilst working for Jabba, but that was never really made clear. As mentioned, Boba's backstory with the Tuscans is the strongest aspect of this series. It creates a good 
enough reasoning behind his lead with respect ideology. Only after years of servitude to the Empire and then stripping himself down to nothing does he come to this realisation. It's great stuff. Considering he didn't have much characterization to begin with though, it's hard to know whether his character has actually changed or has just been moulded to be a hero character. I would have liked to have seen more instances of Boba being challenged beyond diplomacy as he never truly feels like he's in danger until the final episode. Hell, he never even fires his gun until the finale. It might have been nice to be reminded of his lacking plot armour before then. Slotting the Mandalorian Season 2.5 over the course of this show also feels like cheating, even if the quality of those segments is outstanding for the most part. They've shot themselves in the foot because those that hear about how rocky this show has been might wind up missing out on those two vital Mando episodes for Season 3. I think ultimately Boba Fett got enough screen time in The Mandalorian to satisfy my nerdy thirst, and a whole season of waffle in between Season 2 and 3 just wasn't worthwhile. I give The Book of Boba Fett a 5 out of 10. Being a little forgotten boy to the great bounty hunter. Bounty hunter, we've gone up, up to Liverpool. Swinging from this pole right here with a shot of below to show just how Jane, 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 why is Jane coming to mind? I don't know any Janes. That's rubbish. Don't know what you're doing. Mando, oh no.